So the question is, why is Jesus appearing this way to John now? Why not reappear to John as John knew him on earth? Because see, John and the church are about to go through a time of intense persecution and suffering. And brothers and sisters, when you go through an intense time of persecution, you don't need a sentimental Jesus who simply makes you feel warm at night. You don't need a life coach who is offering you words of encouragement. You need to see Jesus as he really is, as a God who raised from the dead and who controls all things and holds him in his hand. See, watch, watch what happens next. Watch what happens next. Verse 17, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, fear not. Fear not, John. I'm the first and I'm the last. In other words, John, I am absolutely and totally in control. I'm the first and the last. Which it means I was there when it started, and I'll be the last one standing. And that also means I'm everything in the middle. In the meantime, I'm guiding everything. B, if I'm A and I'm Z, I'm also B through Y, guiding it all to my appointed ends. You know, this fall, y'all, I memorized the first chapter of Ephesians with some friends of mine. And one of the phrases that, that just got stuck in my mind that keeps reappearing in various times, I can't get it out of my mind, it's a, Paul, a statement Paul makes in Ephesians 1.11 where he says, we've been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Jesus has a purpose. His purpose on earth, he's made pretty clear. He's building the church and using the church to spread the gospel throughout the earth. The purpose of him who works, not most things, not things in the church, all things according to the counsel of his will, which means there is not one stray molecule in all the universe. There is not one stray cancer cell. There is not one stray spouse. There is not one stray child. There is nothing that is outside of the one who is the first and the last. This week, I read it again in my time with God um, in Matthew, a way that Jesus says the exact same thing. He said, are not two sparrows sold for a cent? They're insignificant to everybody, and yet not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. You can't get more micro than that. The hairs of your head, the birds in the sky that nobody pays any attention to if a bird falls to the ground outside in the woods. Anybody hear it? I don't know, but God knows it. He's somehow a part of it. Now, what I'm not saying, let me be very clear on this. What I'm not saying is that, is that God is the one making anything happen to you. We live in a fallen world and the result is a lot of people do a lot of terrible things to each other. What I am saying is that Jesus promises that none of those things are out of his control and he promises to use every single one of them as a part of his perfect purposes in your life to glorify his name and to extend salvation through you. And I know you can't see it all right now, Many of his purposes for what he does remain hidden until eternity, until suddenly it's unveiled. And then you see that not one molecule was out of place and he accomplished everything he had set himself to. I've compared it before to a tapestry. You know, a tapestry where you see one of these rugs, it's got this exquisite, beautiful design um, on one side. Nothing is out of place. But then you look on the back side of that tapestry and it looks, all the threads look like a chaotic jumbled mess. I've told you that life for us right now often feels like the backside of that tapestry. And it feels like things are out of control. And why is this disease going over here? Why is this happening over here? What happens in the book of Revelation is Jesus takes that tapestry and he flips it on the other side and said, not one thing was out of place. There was not one stray thing that was happening. I was using it all for the purposes I had for the church and for your life. So Jesus goes on, I'm the living one. I died, I died for you, John, by crucifixion and bold. I'm alive forevermore. Now I got the keys of death and Hades, which is, of course, another word for hell. John, not only am I immensely powerful, I died for you so that you would never have to face death. And I'm now using my greatest power, my greatest power, the keys of death and Hades. I am using them to perfect my purposes in you. I've got the keys to everything that could ever threaten you. Death and Hades, and I got the keys to Caesar's kingdom. John, what are you afraid of? John, you really feel like Caesar's winning? The only legacy he's gonna leave is a cheap pizza place nobody wants to go to. John, you really feel like I can't control cancer? John, do you think that I don't know you need a job? Are you really worried about your marriage? John, look at me, look at me, look at my power, look at my control, look at my love. John, why do you doubt? That powerful hand sitting on John's shoulder that can which calms storms, that hand that creates matter out of nothing is nail scarred for John's sin and is the proof that every single thing that John is doing in the world is not out of Jesus, or Jesus is doing in the world is not out of Jesus' control and that he is pursuing his purpose that he has set forth from the foundation of the world and not one of his plans for you or your family will ever fail. Amen. 